Today, uh, we have a very special session planned for you. Uh, we have a special guest, Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. Uh, Kathleen was, uh, yeah. <laughs> the Secretary of Health and Human Services during the H1N1 uh, pandemic. Um, uh, while I was serving as Secretary of DHS, um, prior to uh, that, she was uh, a two-term governor of Kansas um, as a Democrat, which is quite a feat, uh, and uh, prior to that was the insurance commissioner uh, for the state of Kansas. Uh, and so um, uh, she has graced us with her presence uh, today, for which we're very grateful. Uh, Professor Sargent is going to be our interlocutor, uh, and uh, we have the questions that you all submitted uh, prior to class, uh, but uh, with that, I'm going to turn the program over to him. Great. Thank you. Um, we're going to start out by talking uh, really about the experience of the H1N1 pandemic of 2009, and then we'll sort of broaden out to reflect upon lessons learned uh, for, for COVID-19. So I'm going to put my sort of first question uh, to Secretary Sibelius, but I hope Secretary Napolitano may also sort of chime in. And I'd like to ask you to transport us back to sort of April 2009. Now, you've just been sworn in as, as Secretary of HHS. I think you were the last uh, cabinet appointee uh, to be confirmed. And now you're facing a pandemic that has begun, sort of even before your, your Senate confirmation has, has been completed. How do you get a handle on the situation? So what are the first uh, steps that you decide to take in response? Well, nice to be here with all of you. Um, nice to be here at Berkeley, and thank you. Um, to Professor Sargent for inviting me and my good friend Janet. Um, I was a governor in Kansas and had been nominated for HHS as the second choice of President Obama. He nominated Tom Daschle, and part of the way through that confirmation process, former Senator Daschle withdrew his name, so I became the second nominee, uh, and as was just said, was the last to uh, be confirmed in the cabinet, I was in my office on April 28th as governor in Kansas, and we had a plan. The, the Senate was going to begin um, that day to talk about my nomination. I hope to be confirmed, and then when confirmed, I plan to resign, have my lieutenant governor sworn in, get on an airplane with my husband and fly to Washington a day or two later. And I got a call at about 10 o'clock in the morning from somebody in the White House saying, uh, the president has a plane in the air. It will land in Topeka at Forbes Airfield at noon. You need to be on that plane. And I began to explain to the person on the other side, well, that wasn't going to happen because I was governor and I hadn't resigned and I didn't have a job in Washington. And, I, and they interrupted me immediately and said, the president has a plane in the air. It will land. You are to be on the plane. And it was my first reminder that I now had a boss again. <laughs> and so indeed, I got on the plane. And about halfway across the country, I was called to say, the Senate did confirm you. When we landed, I scrambled. I didn't have any idea. When we landed, a person who I barely knew met me at the plane. And I said, where are we going? They said, we're going to the White House. Um, you're going to get sworn in at the White House. The president's waiting for you. Well, it turns out that the president doesn't have the authority to swear anybody in. So he had to find somebody who had that authority. And he stood and held the Bible. And I got sworn in. And then he said to me, I have to leave because I'm going to a reception for new cabinet members. You're going to the Situation Room where Janet Napolitano, um, your friend, is already hosting a call with the Canadian health minister and the Mexican health minister and the head of WHO. Um, and so that's how my day started. Um, we, this was about 6 o'clock at night by the time somebody showed me where the Situation Room was, and I participated in this couple-hour call. And then everybody got up and left the room, and I said, I called my best friend from college, where... I had gone in Washington and said, are you and your husband still up? 
She said, yeah, where are you? I said, well, I'm at the White House now, but I just became a cabinet member and I'd like to go woohoo with somebody and maybe I could come over to your house. So it, it started very quickly. It was very much underway. Janet, I knew. Um, we had served together as governors. We were friends. I was thrilled that she was there. So we, and what quickly became evident was that President Obama had Secretary Napolitano as head of Department of Homeland Security do sort of the all of government approach and lead that edge of the effort and I was in charge of the health side of the effort. So we were working on a vaccine, we were looking at a major vaccination program, we were in charge of the CDC putting out guidance. None of us had ever been through a pandemic before, including the President of the United States. Um, so this was all kind of learn as you go with a fire hose pointed at you and people were panicking. And just to give you a snapshot, at that time, while the ultimate results of H1N1 turned out to be not as dire as everyone had feared, what was really terrifying was first it was a strain of the flu that people hadn't seen before and hadn't seen in years. And secondly, a much younger population was dying. There were teachers who had died being exposed in class with no underlying health condition and kids who had died. That is a very unusual death toll for a flu, which usually hits older Americans and people with underlying health conditions. So this was really sending shock waves through the country and there was no vaccine. So we, um, we scrambled, but Secretary Napolitano had begun to mobilize a, an effort across government and I was able to step in and kind of join a train that was racing down the tracks uh, at that point. Great, thank you. So we actually have a, a great opportunity here to get the other side of this story and to ask uh, Secretary Napolitano sort of to reflect upon the experience of having to manage a global pandemic without a confirmed secretary of, of HHS. How did that go? I kept looking around going, um, <laughs> So uh, the secretary of uh, DHS, uh, um, you know, in, in the event of a pandemic, uh, is responsible for the all of government uh, uh, organization as HHS takes the lead on uh, all the health uh, related matters. Um, and so we were just beginning to figure out what, what it is we were dealing with. We knew it was a new type of flu. Um, we knew we didn't have a vaccine. And we knew that uh, it was uh, impacting young kids. In fact, uh, uh, the first case in the United States was uh, a young child uh, in California who was diagnosed uh, 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 in March of '09, um, and and uh, when I think back, we were a brand new administration. Uh, you know, the president didn't get sworn in until January the 20th. Uh, we were most of us were you know still finding finding out where the where the Xerox machine was, and 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 who had what email address, and. Uh, when the White House called, uh, did you have to take that call? Um, uh, or did anybody who worked within uh, that whole complex uh, simply lob calls saying, we're from the White House, um, and uh, uh, should you assume that that meant they were calling uh, for the president himself? Um, uh, so we were brand new, uh, uh, but... Um, uh, we were able to um, figure out a few things relatively quickly. One is that uh, we, we needed to communicate clearly and um, uh, concisely uh, with the public about what we knew and what we didn't know. Um, and so we began a battle rhythm of having regular uh, press events um, uh, 
uh, uh, initially we held them up at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and I, I would be there and, and we would invite uh, other cabinet members to be uh, stand uh, to stand with me, um, and and we began a constant litany of uh, you need to um, uh, uh, sneeze uh, into uh, your elbow, you need to um, wash your hands thoroughly, um, uh, you you need to. Um, uh, uh, practice uh, to the extent you can social distancing, but um, it was those kind of very basic public health messages that we just kept repeating and repeating and repeating, uh, even as uh, we began um, uh, uh, doing the science and getting getting the vaccine. I'm going to let Kathleen talk about the whole issue with vaccines. Um, and what we discovered at that time about vaccine uh, in the United States. But um, so it was a matter of kind of shepherding um, uh, my fellow cabinet members. It was a matter of a clear, as clear as we could make it, communications plan, uh, which, um, as I said, required us to say what we didn't know as much as what we did know. Uh, and, and, and then putting ourselves in the hands of the scientists. And I would just follow that up by saying we worked for a president who really believed to his core that the science had to be followed and made that clear. And every time there would be a deviation or a battle with the politicos wanting to move in one direction, he would come back to that. And, I think it was one of the most courageous acts that I've ever seen because he really didn't know where that would lead us or exactly what the result would be. And there were, you know, possibilities that you would have millions of children dying across the country or, you know, a terrible result that could topple his very new presidency. But over and over again, the communication of tell him what you know and tell him what you don't know and say it again and say it again really came from him. And he believed that to his core and followed that at every step along the way. You want to talk about doing a full Ginsburg? <laughs> so how many, I, you all are infinitely younger than we are. So how many of you have heard the term full Ginsburg and know what that means? One. So Ginsburg was Monica Lewinsky's lawyer. Um, the and she's about to be famous all over again. Um, but there was a Sunday morning routine where um, there were five talk shows on Sunday morning that ran back to back to back to back. And it turned out that Mr. Ginsburg was the first person ever to do all five shows in person on a Sunday. And so that became known as the full Ginsburg. It got from station to station to station. Now some of them are pre-taped and some of them are this and some of them are that. But Janet and I, I think the second week I was there, along with Rich Besser, who is, um, he was headed, acting head of the CDC at that point, but is about a six foot five inch doctor um, who, curled himself into a little ball and was able to get into the very back of an SUV while the two of us rode in the regular seats. And we managed to do the full Ginsburg, I think the first Sunday in May, which was quite a feat. Right, right. And we kept telling people during the full Ginsburg, you know, you gotta wash your hands thoroughly, you gotta sneeze into your elbow, et cetera, so. Well, let me ask you both, uh, before we come back to the, to the question about vaccines, let me ask you both uh, to reflect upon the ways in which your experience, very recent experience, uh, in, in your case, uh, Secretary Sebelius, as state governors shaped your sort of engagement with federal pandemic response. And just to provide some context for the question, one of sort of the key themes that we've stressed over the course of this semester has been the necessity for cooperation uh, between levels of government, state, local, and, and federal, in order to affect uh, sort of effective security policy. So did you find that your experience uh, running states was a sort of source of insight, uh, even advantage, uh, when it sort of came your turn to, to manage the federal government's response? 
Well, I think having been a governor certainly helped. It helped in all kinds of ways. The rhythm is somewhat the same. You're in a cabinet. We as governors had cabinets. You work with the legislative process to get budgets done and bills passed. And I think all of us, I, I certainly had, um, and I know Janet had other ones, but had dealt with disasters within our own state. I, I hadn't ever had a pandemic, but we'd had natural disaster, you know, tornadoes wiping out a whole town or um, fires that destroyed areas. So you had to mobilize resources, set up a kind of command post. Uh, there were health issues related. Uh, there were medical issues related. In the case of uh, our tornado response, we had to set up a temporary morgue. I mean, things that you knew to mobilize state resources to share those with uh, local citizens. And so that, that opportunity was helpful. This was clearly at a very, very different level. And I would say that um, you know, the H1N1 began in Mexico. Um, and then kind of traveled north. So the North America was really the epicenter. When you think of um, Wuhan, China being the potential epicenter of the outbreak of the pandemic, I mean, we were really in North America the epicenter and it began to spread globally. We had wonderful partners. The Mexican health ministry and the Mexican government did a truly amazing job, I think, kind of standing up, giving very transparent information, and taking a huge economic hit in Mexico. I mean, they shut down beaches, they shut down travel, they, they relied heavily on sources of income that they just cut off immediately, trying to stem this outbreak, because nobody knew. And they shared information very openly um, with both the United States and with Canada. Uh, so. None of us had, I mean, I at least had never had an international crisis like that, that that happened in Kansas. But there were some parts of the puzzle that at least were more understandable. And that you have to make quick decisions, that you don't necessarily know the, you gotta gather the best possible information you can and then make a call because not acting is not an option. And I think that's one thing that you learn in the, disaster at a state level, you can't just stop and say, oh, let me go back to class. I need to read that next chapter of the book. Let me think about this a while. I'll go back to hit. I mean, you have to just keep moving. And you're going to probably make some mistakes, but then you correct them and move on. Right. You, you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, um, to use the, the cliche. And, um, and, and, and you need to quickly understand um, what tools you do have at your disposal. Um, who do you have amongst the staff who may have some knowledge? Uh, uh, what are some outside resources that you can draw upon? Um, uh, and, and, and then I can't emphasize enough how important communication is with the public. Um, because if you get the communication part wrong, uh, um, your, your crisis management will, will lack credibility. It's really interesting for those of you who may look at medical issues or be interested in medicine in any way. Epidemiology has a couple of core principles, but one of the core principles for epidemiology is communication, uh, is clear, concise, accurate, communication on a regular basis. And that's considered as important as documentation of what you're dealing with, of demonstrating a pattern of looking at certain aspects. And I, I would say one of the differences, uh, dramatic differences between 09 outbreak and what happened um, in 2020 particularly was that the communication was uh, inconsistent, often inaccurate, and contradictory in 2020. And I think ours frustrated people because we didn't try to make things up or spin it or tell them. I mean, as Janet said, you, you learned how to sneeze over and over and over again because that's really all we had to share until we could share something else. Um, but that was done pretty accurately. And everybody was on that same page, including the President of the United States, who stuck to the script. Terrific. Um, so, so let's sort of focus on, on the question of how the federal government 
connected with, with other governments to manage the effects of the pandemic. I'd be interested to hear more uh, about the Mexican angle, which seems to, to strike some interesting contrasts with the role of China in, in relation to the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. So, so more, more on that aspect would be really interesting. But also, uh, it would be interesting to hear more about how the federal government interacted with, with state governments. I am struggling to recollect uh, any instances of uh, sort of adversarial confrontation between the federal government and any state government in, in 2009, which of course again is very different from the pattern uh, that we saw in 2020, uh, in which the federal government recurrently found itself at loggerheads with state governments. Think Liberate Michigan. So um, I, I don't know if, if perhaps Janet, if you want to address the international uh, dimension and, and then we could ask Secretary Sebelius to, to reflect upon how relations with the state governments were managed? Well, I'll let Kathleen talk about the WHO. Um, but in terms of Mexico, that uh, I had had quite a bit of experience working with uh, the national government uh, in Mexico, both at the federal level and at the state uh, level, the state of Sonora, um, uh, because Arizona was a border state. And we had a huge Arizona-Mexico commission. and. Uh, uh, I'd been there uh, to Mexico City several times uh, to meet with uh, then President Fox and, and so forth. Uh, and um, frankly, I, I was not surprised at the cooperation that we got uh, with Mexico. Um, on something like this, a pandemic uh, 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 that, that, that they uh, would see their interests fully aligned with the interests of the United States and of Canada and actually view this as a, almost a continental um, problem as, a, as opposed to just a, a national problem uh, for them. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, the, one of the first meetings we convened in the Situation Room was with Mexico and Canada to, to make sure that we were all seeing the same things, um, sharing information, saying the same things, uh, et cetera. Well, as Janet said, the WHO, the World Health Organization, is the umbrella group in charge of uh, coordinating assets for health. Uh, everyone has a delegation. It's, it's much like the UN for health issues. And so delegations come and meet. There's an annual meeting. There are ongoing committees. And uh, they were really very actively involved in, in helping to uh, coordinate uh, this effort and begin to look out for the outbreaks in other places around the globe. And eventually, H1N1 did spread. And they're very interested in equitable vaccine distribution and getting assets up and running and monitoring results. So that, that was very key. The head of the World Health Organization when we had this outbreak was a woman named Margaret Chan who had been the leader in China during the bird flu outbreak. So she was very familiar with pandemics and how um, really frightening they can be. Uh, and. She had mobilized resources, countrywide resources, to help shut down that uh, outbreak in China with the avian flu and really probably save millions of lives by quick action. So she was well suited to now lead this global effort. Um, I think that in terms of the relationship with states and federal governments, uh, the way disasters typically work is Ideally, a disaster doesn't happen everywhere at the same time, unlike the pandemic that we, we're experiencing now. It, it is more often a localized effort. And, and what happens in terms of the precedent and protocol is that the local unit of government, city or county, mobilizes whatever resources they have available. And then if, if those clearly are not going to be enough, call on the state for additional help, additional money, additional resources, manpower, equipment, whatever, 
If that's not enough, then you see a federal disaster request, which means that the level of support needed exceeds what's available within the borders of a state and you need some kind of federal disaster declaration. You often see that in a, you know, a tornado or a huge flood or a multi-state effort. A national disaster works just the opposite in terms of tiering, where the federal government takes the lead. And if the outbreak is potentially going to be national in scope, mobilizes the resources and then begins a kind of command and control down through the states. Uh, we will purchase vaccine and make the vaccine available to all of you. We will mobilize equipment and make that available to all of you. We will try to equitably distribute assets if there are a limited number of assets. And while, um, Daniel, you might not remember the acrimony, we did have some somewhat acrimonious times with states because vaccine with H1N1, when it was available, wasn't in large enough numbers to distribute to everybody simultaneously, and you had to make choices. And the choices that the scientists made were looking at where the outbreak was most serious and trying to get the distribution there. And there were states who loudly complained through their members of Congress that they were being short shrifted and more should go to Maine than to Georgia. And there were close to fisticuffs in committee rooms, but um, there wasn't really a question of jurisdiction. It was more, we need resources. and you know, debate with the federal government were those being accurately distributed. Again, we saw that flipped on its head in 2020, where the federal government, uh, the president at the time and his advisors, refused to mobilize the federal resources, did not take ownership of the disaster, did not gather resources and distribute them, basically said to states, you're on your own. Go find your own masks, go find your own PPE, figure out ventilators um, and you know the notion somehow that Kansas would be competing with not only California but other entities to try and figure out where in the world to get face masks for um, medical work. I mean, nobody had ever seen anything like the chaos that involved um, responding to the COVID uh, experience before because it, it flipped the experience on its head. The federal government did not use the Defense Production Act, did not use the huge purchasing leverage power that they have with a global marketplace, did not use the distribution enterprises, didn't use the logistics that they have to try and make sure that people had the resources that they needed in the right place at the right time. Essentially just said, you know, figure it out on your own. As you, What did you say? The quote from Jared Kushner was, we're not shipping clerks, or? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Great, let's, let's pick up the, the vaccine thread, um, because it would be interesting, I, I think, for everybody here to hear more about sort of the point in the story at which the vaccine uh, emerges in 2009 as a plausible uh, solution. You know, how effective is the vaccine? How do you deal with the problems of production uh, that an effective vaccine creates, problems of distribution? Well, I'd say 2009, we were pretty lucky because it was a flu strain, even though people hadn't seen this before. A flu vaccine is made every year. And so there's a lot of experience looking at the strain that the virus may take and then finding targets for that virus. So this wasn't, this was very different than the vaccine we have this year, which is a an entirely um, new vaccine. There had never been a vaccine for COVID outbreaks before, but flu vaccine was a yearly production. So once you could figure out what the strain was from samples in first in Mexico and then Canada and confirmed in the United States, people got to work on taking what is basically a flu basis and, and flipping it around and targeting it. And it turned out, again, to be uh, a lot of scientific luck. Within about six months, there was a very effective vaccine. Good news. Bad news, the United States did not have the capacity, manufacturing capacity, to make enough vaccine to vaccinate our population. And guess what? The countries that had more capacity than we did, 
logically wanted to first vaccinate their populations and then uh, provide additional vaccine to the United States. So we had contracts in place eventually to purchase vaccine uh, for the whole of country vaccination effort. But in many places, we were third or fourth in line behind their population. And you know, if it was an EU country, they already had other places um, mobilized. So there was a real production issue. And you can't just change other vaccines need very clean lines and a certain uh, processing that is a much higher degree of um, lab capacity than most pill makers ever have. So you can't take a normal factory and just flip it over and have it make vaccines. You have to have dedicated lines to do that. Um, and one of the results in the after action, I mean, luckily, the disease turned out to be not as lethal as was feared, but we vaccinated probably 100 million people uh, by the time that was determined. It started with kids. I mean, it, this was a whole different ball game where you started with children and pregnant women because they were the most at risk and then we kind of went up the food chain. Um, but the after action report was that we now have enough capacity that new grants were given um, to firms in the United States, and there's now 100% capacity in the United States to produce vaccine, which was one of the reasons once a successful vaccine was found for this pandemic, we could actually make enough very, very quickly here in the U.S. that we weren't dependent on Germany or Northern Ireland or other areas for manufacturing capacity. So let me ask a question that, that will not surprise the students who in my uses of history class uh, last, last year, which is um, what sort of earlier cases were you able to look to uh, to inform and guide your, your pandemic response? I, I think one of you, I think Secretary Sebelius mentioned that sort of nobody in the administration had direct experience of managing a pandemic. And you actually have to go back uh, several decades, right, probably to the, to the mid-1970s, to find the last uh, sort of major uh, you know, pandemic uh, in, in the US experience. Before that, maybe you have to go all the way back to 1919. Is, is a serious effort made to grapple with, with those earlier historical cases? Or do the challenges in 2009 just seem you know, sufficiently different that the history is sort of not, not relevant? Well, there hadn't actually been a pandemic, I think, in about 70 years. Um, which is really a global situation. The, in the 70s, um, very similar to 2020, Gerald Ford was running for re-election, and um, he, there was an outbreak of a strain of flu that was uh, quite serious, and there was a vaccine developed, and they decided that they would mount a national vaccination campaign and that he would be the leader of that and that that was one of the issues that he would highlight in his reelection efforts. And he did just that. He got vaccinated with great fanfare in the White House and had a lot of, a lot of production and they began this national vaccination effort. What happened relatively quickly was that um, the, vaccin the vaccine itself began to produce symptoms that later became identified as Guillain-Barre syndrome in a number of patients. And it happened frequently enough in the first three or four months that they stopped the vaccination campaign altogether. And the virus ended up dying out and more people in the long run had Guillain-Barre syndrome than actually uh, were seriously ill from Guillain-Barre than were from the vaccine. So one of the things President Obama did was gather the principles of that effort. The former head of the CDC, the guy who had been the Secretary of Health in the White House, the person who had been in the virology department, and to say um, there were six or seven all white men in their 80s at this point who all came to the White House to give basically a history lesson in what went right and what went wrong. And clearly things had gone very wrong. But the president was very eager to learn how to avoid those mistakes. And so they said a couple of very interesting things. They said, first of all, Mr. President, Gerald Ford made a huge mistake taking this 
ownership into the White House. You don't want to do that. You want the scientists to own it. You want people to listen to the science. You don't want to make this a political issue. You certainly want to be a leader, you, but keep it out of the White House, step number one. Step number two, they said, we didn't have any off-ramps. Once we decided to go with the vaccine campaign, there was no time where we were to evaluate that or measure how widespread the disease was or look at anything. It was just go full tilt. He said, we clearly should have had an off-ramp. And they said, third, Mr. President, you need somebody, not you, but somebody in this administration who is the face of the flu. And I was seated right next to the president where Janet is, and the president leaned over and put his arm around me and said, see her, this is the face of the flu. And I said, well, I've been called a lot of things, but never that. But they then talked about the agencies and how the agencies you know, worked and operated, and they really didn't you know, regret having gone forward. They did regret not having the ability to stop. And, and I think that was taken very much into account. But the fact that they moved fairly quickly, tried to save lives, and there was a really adverse incident, um, and they, they didn't stop quickly enough once that adverse effect. That's why you see the adverse action reports are often talked about, you know, that the myocardius was found in some younger kids, so they pause the testing and they look further and they, um, because people take that very, very seriously. The last thing you want is the medication to be more toxic than the disease, and that can happen, um, particularly if you're dealing with a whole new um, vaccine. But that's what happened in 1970. But he was wise enough very quickly to get people together. And I think both Janet and I will tell you, we never, I never got a call from the Trump administration. How about you, buddy? No, uh-uh, uh-uh. Mm. Kind of amazing. I know. Even though I'm the face of the flu, nobody ever has. <laughs> so, so let's push a little bit harder on this sort of theme of, of politicization. Uh, you know, everybody who's lived through, through COVID-19 understands how politicized this pandemic has, has been. Was it challenging to resist the politicization of the, of the pandemic in, in 2009? Or, or did you just not confront sort of forces that were striving to politicize it? Well, so there were some, there were some interesting episodes. Uh, so, um, uh, in April of 09, it may have been early May, there was a cabinet uh, meeting. Uh, and then uh, as, as we're leaving the cabinet meeting, Rahm Emanuel, who's the president's, the White House chief of staff, he points at me like this, and he points at Kathleen like this, and he points at Arne Duncan, the secretary of education like this, and uh, he appointed, um, uh, uh, one or two of our, I think uh, Eric Holder, the Attorney General, he says, come in my office. And so uh, we go uh, into his office and we're sitting around a conference table. Uh, and uh, by, by now we know that this is a flu that is infecting school-aged uh, children at a higher rate than elderly Americans. Um, uh, there have been some deaths in the New York City public schools. Um, uh, we still didn't have a vaccine. Uh, and uh, Rom was, uh, was, was very strong, as only Rom can be. Uh, and he uh, w wanted us to uh, immediately begin to take more aggressive uh, uh, action, um, uh, because uh, I think he was afraid that the president was not looking presidential enough. Uh, and so one of the things he, he wanted uh, 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 Secretary Duncan to do was to order all the nation's schools to close. Um, now, uh, uh, first of all, this is before Zoom. So remote learning is not available. 
Uh, secondly, if kids aren't in school, that means their parents aren't at work, uh, and that has economic ramifications. Um, and, uh, um, and you could just kind of march your way through the domino effects of, of that. Uh, um, but uh, the fundamental question was, um, as, as the Attorney General uh, piped up and said, is that the President doesn't have the authority to close the nation's schools. Um, that authority is possessed uh, at the local level. Um, and uh, so the President can encourage, um, he may be even be able to incentivize, but he cannot mandate that the schools be closed. Um, and that's the closest I ever thought we came to politicization of uh, the response. Well, and I think also a key difference in, in this instance that Janet is describing is that the scientists did not favored that response. They weren't saying close the schools. In fact, the CDC was saying just the opposite. They said this was a virus that actually was moving fairly slow. You could watch it move. You know, Kansas would have a big outbreak, and then it would die down, and then Missouri would have a big outbreak, and it would die down. So you could actually watch this move. And their suggestion very strongly was close a school when enough personnel are affected that you can't safely run the school, but don't close schools preemptively. First, it won't stop the virus from spreading. Secondly, according to the CDC and public health, you are putting kids more at risk. For, they'll be roaming around malls, they'll be out. A lot of children rely on schools for food, for safety, and you know, you're, you're actually putting them at higher risk out of school than in school. So there was a, a really key difference. Um, uh, Janet is very diplomatic, describing Rahm as forceful. He was saying, shut the fucking schools now. They've got to close now. I mean, now, pounding on the table. And the secretary, the former secretary of education, who is the loveliest man in the world, I thought was going to have either a heart attack or just throw up on the floor. He <laughs> turned this color, greenish gray, and just was in shock and horror as we all said, it's going to be all right. We're not going to pay. Don't worry about it. This is not going to happen. Um, but it, yes, that was, that was a very close call. And what we, and a lot of us finally said is, let's go hand in hand with you, Mr. Chief of Staff, and walk into the president's office, and we'll have this battle there. Because, you know, I'm with the science. I'm not rewriting the CDC's recommendation. Secretary Duncan is not closing. This. I mean, you want to have this? Let's go down the hall and have it with him. And he's like, no, oh, no, you know, we don't. Never mind. Um, but you could see how, in a different situation, where there is a tension between the politicians who may want to protect their principle, as they're called, their essay, you know, they want the president to look very presidential, and they have one point of view, and the scientists may have a different point of view, and somebody else, and that can be testy um, and difficult to, to figure out. And I think we, we saw that play out again in the, um, but what, again, you saw over and over in the last administration was rewriting the science by the politicos who were put in the office to rewrite the science. And that's a very scary place to be in the middle of a pandemic. Um, right, and the, the other issue that was more in my lane than, than yours, uh, Kathleen, was uh, there were uh, many who were urging us to uh, shut the ports of entry um, and shut down the borders. Um, uh, uh, to, to keep the virus from uh, spreading. And uh, we had to point out that uh, viruses don't themselves go through a port of entry and are not themselves inspected. Um, uh, and that, uh, again, the economic and trade implications of uh, doing that would be quite severe. Uh, but um, keep, and since keep, we were the origin of the virus, we, it was really hard to shut it right. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, but uh, we we did get um, uh, some 
particularly uh, some Republican pushback to that, uh, to those who wanted us to close the international air travel, close the port, land ports of entry, and so forth. So back in 2009, the Republicans wanted to elevate public health over the economic adverse effects that precautions might have produced. No. Uh, no. I don't think this had anything to do with public health. <laughs> I mean, I don't. No. I, no. The, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 I think it was politics. No. I think it, they, they, they wanted to um, some, not all, no. certainly not like it is today. Um, uh, but uh, they wanted to use the H1N1 uh, pandemic to undercut President Obama. Yeah. So, so let me ask a slightly different version of the question, and this is a question that a number of students uh, sort of raised in, in the discussion forum, which is the question of how you manage trade-offs. Because you've both spoken about sort of different kinds of trade-offs that had to be confronted. You, you know, trade-offs in the arena of, of child welfare, the modicum of protection against transmission of the virus that might be achieved through closing schools has to be weighed off against all of the adverse effects that school closures would have on, on the well-being of children, on child nutrition, on, on child education, and so on. In, in the arena of sort of border biosecurity, you have to weigh the trade-offs, uh, you know, the benefits that might be achieved uh, through the closure of borders against the very heavy sort of economic and, and even geopolitical costs uh, that will be borne as a result. So I'm really curious, and I think many of the students are really curious too, about how you manage those trade-offs. I, I know you've both um, spoken of sort of following the guidance of, of scientists, but scientists are fundamentally specialists, right? And an, 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 an epidemiologist who's fundamentally concerned with sort of limiting the transmission of a particular virus may not be so attentive uh, to the downside costs that school closure would have on early childhood education or on uh, child nutrition. Those are sort of the domains of other, other specialists. So what, what level of government do these sort of competing trade-offs become you know, sort of synthesized into you know, a framework for, for decision? And is that in the end a technical decision or, or is it a political decision? Well, I'll take a shot, but um, I, I think at the end of the day, it is ultimately the president of the United States in a national crisis that has to be the chief decider and hopefully aggregate all the information and be guided by whatever set of principles he or she is closely adhering to. Um, we actually had a situation where the decisions were kind of uh, opposite of what the decisions needed to be for the COVID outbreak, in large part because the virus moved at, at very different paces. It became apparent that it was receding on its own, and we had an effective vaccine, and, and, and. This virus has taken a very different tact, where it was wildly contagious, far more than the flu strain in 2009, it has become more lethal, not less lethal. And I think those aspects are all about balancing risk. But there's no question that at every step along the way, I mean, shutting down places of business has a ripple effect on paying rent and eating food and being able to take care of your kids. It, it has, you know, there are losses and gains. And so I think it's a a risk measurement as much as anything, um, and an attempt to mitigate and control uh, death and serious illness. I, I, I am still flabbergasted that we now have crossed the threshold of 700,000 deaths. And I still believe that's an undercount because lots of people are likely to have died from COVID-related illnesses and not been directly counted as COVID. But 700,000 people is a whole lot of folks. And that mitigation strategy uh, has not been effective, clearly. I think 
we ended up in the period before we had a vaccine losing about 12,000 people um, to H1N1, and um, that's too many, but in an average flu season, you lose almost 35 to 50,000 people, mostly older, mostly immune compromised. So in perspective, uh, the mitigation effort worked and it worked very quickly and, and effectively. Um, but I think it's, it's that risk and some of it is tactical and some of it is political. And you know the, the figure at the top of this food chain is an elected political figure and he or she has to make that determination, I think at the end of the day. Well, at least they need to own the determination. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, uh, and in a pandemic situation, what you don't want to end up with is uh, the, the political considerations outweighing the um, scientific uh, considerations. I mean, there are going to be some on both sides of that equation. Uh, they're not necessarily in... in, in uh, opposite tensions with each other. I mean, what what uh, can be good science can also be good politics. But um, but when they are in tension, you've got to be able to weigh them. And uh, uh, and and if you're a member of the cabinet, uh, you know you provide um, the White House uh, with your your best uh, uh, advice. Uh, and then you ultimately you take your direction from the White House as to what direction they want to go, and then you're in charge of implementing that direction. And I would just say that that tension is not um, necessarily unusual in, in a cabinet and in a political operation. It isn't uncommon, and let's move this outside of a pandemic, which hopefully is an uncommon experience. In normal day-to-day -day policy, um, for instance, the Department of Health and Human Services might have one view about um, food labeling and come at that from a public health point of view. We want people to know how much glucose is in this box of cereal, how much extra sodium, how much this. The Department of Agriculture, on the other hand, also cabinet office, also appointed by the president, has a very different view of what it is that is beneficial for the consumer to know, what it is that's beneficial for farmers to have access to. So that tension of different lenses, different approaches uh, is often present on all kinds of issues at all kinds of times. And at the end of the day, it is the president who makes the call, gathering hopefully as much information as he or she can synthesizing it and then making a call of go, no go. So a pandemic just adds an additional layer. And in this case, brand new president, global crisis, a lot of uncertainty. And you know, we saw a president act very clearly, concisely, courageously, I think. It turned out he had a lot of luck with him, which is terrific. But you know, making the call over and over and over again that, you know, we would move in this direction and stay in this direction. And, um, and you did a lot with employers. And I mean, that was the other piece of the puzzle that employers were really struggling to figure out what they should, should they close a workplace? Should they not close a workplace? A lot of their workers did not have paid leave, didn't have health insurance, didn't have, they needed the income. So all of those issues had to be dealt with. Great. So, so let's turn to address directly, sort of, you know, a topic that's been a little bit of a elephant uh, in in the room, the previous guy, and his management of the COVID nineteen pandemic. So let me. That guy is <laughs> Colbert would call. Let, let me let me start by by, by asking a, a softball question. What did Donald Trump get right in his response to to COVID nineteen? Operation Warp Speed with vaccines was a major play that was um, game changing. And that was a series of things. Accelerating development by putting a big pot of money on the table and basically saying, if you have a successful vaccine, we will buy it. That actually is the best way right now to get any pharma company to do anything. Put it seriously. 
big pot of money on the table and say, the government will be a willing buyer. If you make a new antibiotic, we will buy it. If you make this, we will buy it. Uh, absent that, it's hard to get the attention of folks. But so that taking down some of the regulatory barriers and making it clear that people had to work together, having a consistent approach, uh, pre-purchasing, not enough. I, I, I don't know who the hell came up with the numbers. The guy who's not the shipping clerk, I think, <laughs> made the numbers. But you know that, I think, was a real triumph of public-private partnership, scientific innovation, cash on the barrel head, we will purchase it, we will distribute it. Um, that, I would say, was a success. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um, and um, it's, it's interesting, a lot of the science uh, that underlay the vaccine, the mRNA uh, science, uh, had been underway for a while, was actually taxpayer funded. Um, but uh, uh, to get the vaccine manu manufactured, making vaccine is a tough manufacturing process. You, you don't, um, it's not like making a widget. Uh, it, it, it is, as Kathleen says, it requires very clean lines and specialized equipment and all kinds of uh, and trained employees. Um, and uh, uh, that's where uh, the, the private sector came in. But I would say virtually nothing else. And I, I, I say that um, I think the attempt to gown and mask and appropriately clothe frontline personnel was a unmitigated disaster that could have been helped. The distribution of equipment was basically an unmitigated disaster. The unwillingness to accurately communicate with the American public was wrong from start to finish. And refusal to participate in the international effort to begin to mobilize resources and contracts. And again, part of the reason that the international effort is still struggling is without the pot of money that I talked about that the United States made available to themselves, Lots of people were not willing to set aside contracts for developing countries, understandably. You know, if we can sell it to the rich guys, we're gonna sell it to the rich guys, we're not gonna distribute it. So the United States refusing to participate in the COVAX effort um, will mean that COVID is around for several more years, if not longer, because we're gonna have a hell of a time vaccinating the rest of the world um, in any equitable fashion. So I think there was mistake after mistake after mistake and guidance that was not clear, not uniform, contradictory information. Um, and uh, you know the number of quack drugs and products, what is this new thing, the horse deworming? What's? It Ivermectin, yes. I, I blanked it out of my, I mean, hydroxychloroquine was first, then, you know, lighting yourself up with light bulbs and um, drinking bleach and then ivermectin. Um, but, you know, that, that will, again, I think that's one, gonna be one of the most lasting legacies um, is a real, disinformation war that is very much still underway and undermines people's confidence that they there is a set of facts and figures that they can believe in. I, I think that is likely to be very, very damaging to any public health effort in the future. Right. Well, this might be a good opportunity to introduce a question about a sort of social media and its relationship to the current pandemic. Because some of the challenges that, that you've just described, you know, sort of misinformation, uh, public confusion about quack remedies, well, you could see sort of antecedents uh, to some of these problems even before the pandemic, right? And the rise, including in quite liberal places like Marin County, of a sort of anti-vaccination movement of parent Facebook groups, uh, you know, positing that maybe it would be better to get measles than to take the measles vaccine. Uh, so I wonder you know, sort of how, how government can combat sort of the, the misinformation, the disinformation that social media has proved so effective in generating? Well, that's a question that no one has a very good answer to uh, right now. Um, 
you know, I think uh, it, it's a, it's 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 in part about what you say. It's it's in part who says it, and it's in part what medium is used uh, to to say it. Um, uh, and unfortunately, uh, when uh, the public kind of turns on on you and you start seeing a large uh, anti-vax movement. Um, uh, it's really hard to see how you turn that back uh, because it, it seems that as, you know, as much information is out there and we've been talking about being very clear in your communications, let the scientists do the talking, et cetera. Once the public turns, it, that, that dial is hard to reverse. I also think, I mean, we talked a little bit um, earlier in the day about the fact that, you know, when you look at the 09 outbreak, um, Facebook was a couple of years old, I think, and, and most of these other medium weren't even there. There was no Instagram, people weren't tweeting, there was no, so there were some generally accepted channels of communication, radio and TV, that um, were pretty limited compared to the opportunities today. And, um, but the anti-vax group was present and was mobilizing misinformation. Um, and I actually participated at, at the point um, in late 2009 where we were close to having a vaccine ready to go. I think we launched the campaign in December. Tom Frieden was the head of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and he was the former health commissioner in New York. He was well known in New York. And at that point, most of the major television stations had producers and their home bases in New York. Um, Atlanta had uh, CNN, but everybody else was in New York. And there was a woman named Jenny McCarthy who was pretty notorious on the anti-vax circuit. She's still out there, but she was being featured often in a almost point-counterpoint effort. They'd put a, up a scientist, Tony Fauci or somebody else, and then they'd have Jenny McCarthy talking about, if you're pregnant, absolutely do not take the vaccine. If you're this, do not take the vaccine. And Tom Frieden and I went to New York and had a series of meetings closed door behind the scenes with these producers. And Tom basically said to them, you are killing people. You are responsible for people dying because this information is not based on any scientific fact. I can give you 14 studies, 25 studies, however many you want. And if you continue to show this as a this opinion and this opinion side by side, it gives gravitas to the anti-vaccine folks. It gives them a platform and a modem, and you are being very dangerously cavalier with information. And they stopped. They stopped providing a forum on national television for that point of view, which wasn't documented. Now, shutting that off, you see, you know, Francis Houghton of the Facebook Leaker uh, is talking about the fact that they they have clear data from Facebook that algorithms were driving misinformation and ginning people up into further and further scurrilous notions about the vaccine, and they refused to stop it because it meant more clicks and it meant more. So I don't know how you counter um, serious efforts at misinformation in in this age and you know what we've seen is a real attack on the science and a real attack on scientists and about 20 percent of public health officials throughout this country have been driven out of office during this pandemic they've either quit or resigned or been you know kind of terrorized to the point that they can't any longer do their jobs because they are regarded as the enemy and again i think that's a very dangerous place to be um, because if people don't believe the information they're being given and then find the people who are trying to give them information to be the enemy, um, you're in a, a really dark place. 
That's right. It also seems that the politicization of the current pandemic sort of reminds us of the essential wisdom of those veterans of the Ford administration who counseled uh, President Obama in 2009 not to put himself at the front of, of pandemic response. It hasn't done Anthony Fauci a lot of good, but <laughs> thank God for Tony Fauci. He's still there. So, so let me ask you, um, if we're to, to understand the mistakes that the Trump administration uh, makes uh, in the first six months of the pandemic, mistakes that have to do with the distribution of, of PPE, uh, mistakes that have to do with, with the messages uh, that the administration is broadcasting, mistakes that have to do with coordination across scales of government, how do we situate those mistakes sort of in relation to the situation that, that the Trump administration inherits in January 2017, uh, you know, when it's, in, when it's inaugurated? What is the stake of sort of pandemic preparedness at the beginning of, of the Trump era? What's, what's the playbook? Well, there is a playbook. Um, and it was a playbook that is part of the after action to H1N1. Uh, part of the after action to Ebola uh, and Zika. huh and Zika and Zika. Yeah. Um, uh, so there there was a, a, a playbook agency by agency, et cetera. Um, I, I just don't I think they chose for whatever reason not to use it, not to not to take it off the shelf, uh, not to exercise it. Um, and we've, we've talked a little bit in this class before about the value of exercising, and, and we're gonna finish up the class with a big exercise, but um, uh, yeah. Well, I think in addition to the, as Janet said, a comprehensive playbook, how you deal with, um, there were, um, there was an international collaborative setup in, uh, 2014, which included 30 countries, I think by the time that President Obama left office, it was up to 60 countries. And the goal was to establish regional centers of epidemiology across the globe, to train uh, people in Sub-Saharan Africa and in remote parts of China and in Mongolia and in South America and have an ability to quickly identify and contain and control outbreaks, uh, particularly outbreaks of unknown. The Trump administration stopped that effort and did not participate any longer in that effort. Uh, the Trump administration chose at the beginning to get rid of the position that sat on the National Security Council looking at health issues that had been there really since um, uh, 9-11, and uh, because 9-11 had a whole lot of health implications, um, that position left. They pulled the two people out of China who were actually CDC employees in the Wuhan area. They were, um, those positions were not funded and filled in the Trump administration. So it wasn't just not getting the playbook off the shelf. There was a dismantling of actually personnel and expertise, a very intentional. And when you say mistakes made, I, I would like to correct that just a little bit. That indicates they were doing something and did the wrong thing. You know, they chose this instead of that. I think there was a very intentional, um, I'm not at all prejudiced about this or biased, but I really do think there was a very intentional unwillingness to be accountable for being commander in chief at this period of time, which meant that if you exercised any of the muscle of the federal government toward combating this disease, then you own the disease. So if you pretend it's not there, and one of the great examples I, I will never forget was watching the president of the United States at the Centers for Disease Control in March of 2020, give a press conference, first of all saying anybody who wants a test can get one, absolutely false. Everybody in the country knew that was false because nobody could get a test. Secondly, saying that the tests work perfectly, absolutely false. Um, that was clearly not the case. But the third thing that he said when he walked out of the CDC and into continue this press gaggle, if you all remember, there was a ship an American ship full of cruise passengers who were sick. And the President of the United States said, 
I don't want that ship to dock because then my numbers will look really bad. And it was the first time that I thought with a real chill running through my body, oh my God, we are deliberately not testing and not counting people because this guy thinks that that's the way to deny that there's an outbreak is we won't have numbers. My numbers will look bad. And I think that was the clearest statement that he made. He had no intention of mobilizing any of the resources or except for the vaccine. That was to be the silver bullet. We'd work on the vaccine. Other than that, we're ignoring all of this other stuff and we're pretending it doesn't exist. Yeah. All of which, of course, is an important reminder that we're dealing with very specific um, failures of presidential leadership, not just with partisan differences. After all, when the Obama administration comes into office, it's actually, it's inheriting a pandemic playbook from a Republican administration that took pandemics quite seriously as a security threat. Yeah. Yeah. And also a lot of work, you know, the Bush administration did a huge amount of work on um, HIV and AIDS and, and did um, enormous work globally and, and work in the United States. Uh, so yes, there was a definite, you know, building of a security apparatus after 9-11 that worked on health issues as well as, but this was, you know, this halted all of that. Terrific. Well, I want to just interject a quick procedural note and invite any students who want to pose sort of questions on the fly to do so. Uh, so if you could raise your hands and, and Margie will take the microphone. Um, Aaron is right here, so I will not even insert a fill a question. So. Uh, so we've covered a lot how we seem to get kind of lucky to have a president who believed in science with Obama and very unlucky to have a president who completely abdicated authority for COVID. In your opinions, is it possible to design the institutions like the ones you ran to automatically respond to these crises, crises in a depoliticized way? And given that this has happened, we've had someone completely abdicate their responsibility when I don't think anyone thought that was possible, do we need to design these institutions to do that sort of thing? That's a really interesting question. I think the problem is that in our system of government, the head of that institution is going to be appointed by the President of the United States. The political leaders across the board, so at HHS, the head of the FDA, the head of the CDC, the head of the NIH, the Secretary of Health, the Deputy Secretary of Health, the head of emergency response, all of those individuals who direct those agencies are all appointed by the President of the United States. So if you do not have a president who has a point of view that is pro-science and you know, pro-intervention, um, I think it's very hard to design an institution that ignores their leaders and, and goes on their way. That's a little anarchy. And, you know, who is it who's designing that? Who are they listening to? How does that operate? I don't, I don't know how that happens because the, the, all of those agencies are headed by political leaders and all of those leaders are chosen by the president and confirmed most of them by Congress. Yeah, I don't see a way for institutionalizing a kind of a self-correct, auto, auto-correct function. Uh, um, uh, within government for precisely the reason that, that uh, Kathleen uh, says. Um, that, that's, that's not to say that even political leadership, uh, uh, and we talked a little bit about this uh, on Monday, uh, runs into um, taking over for uh, a big government with lots of career people um, uh, who um, may choose or not choose to um, uh, follow the, the leader's direction. But in the, in the end, uh, we're, uh, uh, we're a nation of elected leadership, and the self-correcting uh, feature is the election. Okay. Uh, so for a bit of context to my question, on Monday, Professor Sargent described a dichotomy between crisis management and crisis governance. So uh, to give kind of a reductive summary, crisis management is kind of a reactive measure to kind of 
retroactively minimize damage. And crisis governance is more of a preventive cooperative effort to prevent crises before they start. So first, I'm curious, uh, what forms of crisis governance, if any, do you believe are most effective in relation to pandemics? And second, if those forms of like crisis governance that you believe are most effective are currently not part of bureaucratic practice, do you believe it's realistic that they'll become part of the federal government's strategy in the near future? I think the crisis governance, if I, if I understand the distinction, um, is in part a all hands on deck approach where the response or the preparation uh, or anticipation is not owned by one silo, but is owned by everybody. And I think that that can be very effective at the national level and at the state levels as you're, you know, if you put it into um, production mentality, you know, it's the continuous improvement where you're constantly reevaluating, you're constantly filling holes, you're constantly, and you're retraining and cross-training people and uh, making sure that people um, are ready with the skills that are needed in all the agencies at all the time. So health response is not owned by the health department, it's really owned by uh, a whole lot of folks who are taking this very seriously in both the public and the private sector. Um, I think that can be uh, extraordinarily effective and, and is probably the best way to prepare for the next time is constantly reevaluating what went right, what went wrong. I do think one of the things that the United States is gonna have to do, much like we did in H1N1, is evaluate what capacity do we need to have within the borders of our own country and what is duplicative, too expensive, you can get it better somewhere else. So, um, we did decide that having additional manufacturing capacity was pretty essential. In the event that the entire country would need to be vaccinated, we needed the capacity within this country. I think that same issue needs to go on with protective equipment, with anti-retrovirals, um, with other kinds of, I mean, how much of that needs to reside and be owned and operated within the borders of the United States, how much can you count on a global supply chain? Um, this is one of the first times that I think all the countries in the world needed the same stuff at the same time. Um, so it was usually you can borrow, beg, buy stuff from somebody else because they don't need it. Well, when everybody needs everything all at the same time, it makes it more complicated and I think crisis governance will require us to really evaluate all of those supply issues and logistic issues and exchange issues. I'd say the third thing that crisis government, which we absolutely need again in the United States, I can't speak for other countries because I, I don't know a lot of their holes and gaps. We have a, a public health system in the states that is almost on the verge of collapse. I would say it's on life support. Uh, information gathering is 20 centuries outdated. It's not good. It is not interchangeable in any way, shape, or form. People count things in very different ways. There is not enough personnel. There's not enough response. So rebuilding that entire public health infrastructure, which really has to start at the local level, it can't be a top-down approach. We can't have really smart people sitting at the NIH and the FDA and nobody at the states, because you're never gonna know what the hell's going on. The same way that epidemiologists look for outbreaks and counts and vaccination rates, and that has to be local. But boy, we are, it has been a very long time since any real supply effort has been made at that state and local level um, for an information infrastructure, for an equipment infrastructure, for personnel to train people. The kind of core of health workers that President Biden is talking about would be a huge influx of talent and much needed support. Um, but I think that in terms of crisis governance, boy, if we don't do something about that, we are really uh, 
in very dangerous territory, I think. Hi, um, I wanted to thank you for coming today. It was really nice seeing you speak. Um, I guess my question is sort of about, um, has Biden called you? I kind of want to hear if you have any advice for the current Biden administration. You did add some with this last question, but was there anything else that you would advise this current administration to do? Um, maybe what they've been doing right or maybe what they've been doing wrong as well. Well, I've had a lot of conversations, communication with um, folks who are working on this every day. Um, and that has a lot of the people who are both in the back in the department of HHS, but also in the COVID response at the White House are people I worked with closely. Um, they are experienced, they are, and they reach out on a regular basis uh, about a lot of a lot of things. So I would say there's a lot of dialogue going on and a lot of, because I'm sitting now in the heartland of the country in a Republican based state and with a democratic governor that they've been at war since, they also wanna know what we're hearing, what we're seeing, what, what the response is in the country so they don't get stuck in the Washington bubble. So I, there's a lot of interaction and a lot of, you know, what are you hearing, what are you seeing, what do you need? Who should we talk to um, that goes on regularly? You bet. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I wanted to ask a question. I think you kind of spoke to this, but a little more in detail. We, we spoke a lot about the importance of communication um, in terms of mis and disinformation and also in terms, of, in terms of consistent messaging. But the other aspect is also data sharing in terms of how exactly the virus is spreading around. There was a lot of questions asked during COVID in terms of the numbers being reported internationally and also within different United, within the states, within the United States. Looking back at the H1N1 pandemic, how have the capabilities of public health systems changed in terms of data collection and reporting? And what specific challenges are still there that need to be worked on? Well, I think it's part of what I tried to say um, to the earlier questioner. I think that we have a very broken public health system and data collection system at the state and local level. And that is a very dangerous place to be. Uh, the data is counted differently, collected differently, shared differently. It is not interoperable. It is not readily transparent. Some people do a great job of collecting demographic data and, and racial data and age capacity. Others barely report a death. Um, so it's a real mishmash. And I would say the um, public health is, is traditionally underfunded in the United States. It has gotten significantly worse. The financial crisis of 08 and 09, which Janet and I participated in and watched, um, public health budgets across this country were slashed at that point. They have never been fully restored. And with the pandemic and a lot of um, the discounting of public officials, it's gone down even further. So my guess is we're at probably a 1960s level of public funding if you put it in real dollar terms. Um, that's a very, very dangerous place to be because without that information, without the ability and you know, the CDC puts individuals into state departments of health. Um, and part of that reason is to try and have some kind of a national system of data collection and making um, sense out of data that's coming from various places. But without a robust infusion of dollars for data infrastructure and retraining and hiring a whole lot more people than they have, um, I, we're a long way from where we need to be at the national level. The federal government, and so part of what you get is the federal data appears somewhat erratic because what they're getting is, you know, 100% feeds from 10 of the states, 50% feeds from another 20 states, no feeds from six or seven states, um, and it makes it makes the information about what's going on in the country almost impossible to follow. I think we have time for just one more student question. 
again, thank you for coming here to discuss these subjects um, with us. Um, my question is, um, well, first of all, during this class, we've talked a lot about um, the structure of the, the federal government and the security apparatus and health apparatus and things like that. So if there's out of the, in terms of the bureaucratic organization of the Department of Health and Human Services, is there anything in particular you would change or inversely, what, which aspects of the bureaucratic organization do you think are particularly effective? For purposes of pandemic? Um, even in general. It's a great question, and um, under the HHS umbrella are 11 operating agencies. Each one of them is you know, a huge enterprise in and of itself. So the Food and Drug Administration regulates, it's estimated 25 to 30 cents of every dollar a consumer spends is a product that goes through the FDA. And, NIH is kind of the gold standard for health research in the world. And Centers for Disease Control, everybody wants one in their country. So these are all big enterprises. I, I think the operating agencies um, fundamentally work pretty well. What we did, and I think is an important component, is to try and have a fairly flat table, if you will, where the leaders of all of those organizations met with each other face to face with me on a monthly basis. You could not send a substitute. You could not, you, you needed to be there. Those were recorded on your calendar. Um, and shared information, because what we too often found out is that one agency had no idea what another agency were, was doing. And you assume, you know, that the payers at CMS know what the FDA is doing. Not true, unless you have them actually communicate with one another. So in terms of changes, somehow making sure to institutionalize that, that dialogue and joint decision making and shared competence and getting all of those lenses when a policy decision has to go to the president were really, really valuable. And I'm not sure if that didn't happen, that you wouldn't get a, a far less robust result. So I think with any complex organization, that level of communication and not a hierarchy, not I'm the boss and I'm gonna tell you what to do, but I really wanna know what you know from your lens about the problem I'm trying to solve. I want you to bring it to the table. I want all of those lenses there. And then as the boss, I can make the best possible decision. So I, that doesn't really, it's not to eliminate something, it's actually to add a component of the sense that there is one enterprise, there is one effort, but everybody has a role to participate and lend something to that effort. Um, that's an element that could be missing if it isn't intentionally created. Great, thank you. That's, that's a wonderfully rich sort of concluding point uh, because it's so transferable to any sphere of policy activity. I think that all that remains uh, at, this, at this point is uh, for the class to join me in, in thanking uh, our guest today, uh, Kathleen Sebelius. <laughs> <laughs>